North Korea, the Hermit State. Apart from the people of North Sentinel Island and other tribes in the Amazon, the DPRK is the most closeted place on the planet. A country hidden from the world. A people oppressed. Those who speak up receive punishments far worse than being silenced. A leader worshipped like a god. A regime hell-bent on maintaining its power, willing to torture and kill its own people. An attempt to escape will get you killed, and even if you are successful, it will earn your relatives a lifetime of unimaginable pain and suffering. In 2017, the world was threatened with nuclear war. However, in 2018, an unlikely call for peace. And now the tensions are easing. However, although it might seem calmer to us on the outside, on the inside, a completely different story. Any tourists who come will always have a guide glaring over their shoulders, only showing them what they want you to see. Only showing off selective locations and landmarks. Interviewing officials is like talking to a brick wall, as they constantly dodge questions and use whataboutisms back on the US. Painting a peaceful nation who heap praise on their government, treat military tests as historic moments for their nations, and with the world's fourth largest military, the nation is built for one purpose. War. And they will undoubtedly strike if provoked. And while this guy might tell you this, I think that your country has tremendous economic potential, unbelievable, unlimited. And I think that you will have a tremendous future with your country, a great leader. The reality is that Kim Jong-un is a paranoid, monstrous, vindictive, cruel, relentless dictator. He is willing to go to extreme lengths to protect his image. So in 2014, when a movie about his assassination was approaching release, you can imagine the response. A sense of alarm setting quickly. Here at home, this Toronto theatre was among the first in Canada to cancel its Christmas Day premiere of the interview. Soon after, Cineplex, the country's largest theatre chain, followed suit. Showtimes for the controversial comedy's release disappeared from its website. And then this statement, that the decision to postpone the showing of the film is to reassure our guests and staff that their safety and security is our number one priority. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was that the film had a great chance to cleverly satirize the North Korean regime, and in some elements it kind of did, but to an underwhelming measure. Instead we got a dumb comedy about James Franco and Seth Rogen blowing up Kim Jong-un, complete with all the bad comedy you want. It was like they used all of the good jokes and set pieces in Bad Neighbors earlier in the year, and they just kind of cashed in on the whole North Korean situation, giving us jokes about... Yo, I don't know who I fucked last night, but I got some stink dick! <laughs> what if you hide it in your butt? I don't want to stick it in my ass. Never heard this before in my life. I love Katy Perry! Baby, you're a firework, babe. Do you think that... Margaritas are gay because they are so sweet. Do you pee and poo? Ah, yeah. You're hairy. You're so hairy like a bear. So today I want to talk about the North Korean film we should have got that exposes the nation and a regime for their human rights violations. So here are three options, all based on the stories of those who have made miraculous escapes from North Korea, which could all make for the North Korea movie that we need. Number 1. Oh Chong Song In November of 2017, the world was stunned when a member of the North Korean military made his way across the border and through the joint security area to freedom, getting shot multiple times and needing to be rushed to the hospital for life-saving surgery. Oh Chong Song was concluded to have impulsively defective, apparently jumping in the car and making a dash for freedom, driving past the demarcation line which divides North Korea, eventually crashing in a ditch at the JSA. He tried to make the car start again before soldiers came to shoot at him, making a mad sprint across the demarcation line as his own military shot at him. He sprinted into South Korea, jumping over the low wall and resting, bleeding in a pile of leaves, before South Korean soldiers crawled to his age to free him and take him to doctors. While being operated on, the doctors found up to 30 centimeter long parasitic worms in his intestines, an indication of the health crisis in North Korea. So what could we do with this in terms of a film to tell his story? Song alluded to atrocities when he allegedly confessed to actions which had caused a death or led to a killing of people, which means we could get some sort of insight into what that might have been. Seeing the turn in the societal attitude of the North Korean people, as according to him 80% of people his age are skeptical of the regime. But given the possible nature of his crime, maybe not. Maybe a 10 minute short film. We see him hop in a jeep and he's off, a determined look in his face as he charges past the first checkpoint before getting stuck at the border, 
frantically trying to restart the car before deciding to make a sprint across the border, shots raining down on him before making it across. The film ending as he is saved by the South Koreans and airlifted away. A short, sharp, intense escape with a powerful ending. So that's one, but let's say we want a feature film. Charles Ryu. Charles Ryu's story is one that would make for a three hour epic. When he was five, his father escaped North Korea to China. And six years later, he lost his mother to starvation. Then he had to battle for food, begging and trying to fight starvation. He ended up living with his aunt before his father sent his stepbrother to free him from North Korea. And he was successful. However, after a period of time, he was deported back to North Korea due to their relationship with China. He was put back into a labor camp and the military camp wanted him to confess to trying to defect to South Korea. He worked in the labor camp for 12 hours a day and fed only 150 kernels of corn a day. A low point for him one morning when they were marching. He saw some dried vomit on the side of the road and in an act of pure starvation, he dived to the vomit and he started picking out the rice out of it, eating until he couldn't bear the beating from the guards. Eight months later, he was released because he couldn't stand up or lift his arms, being a useless worker being sent back to his stepbrothers. He then found a job at a coal mine where he was only paid in rice, working six days a week, seeing atrocities such as people losing limbs, and he watched one of his friends get crushed. He then decided to attempt escape again. He left one morning, stealing five flashlights from the coal mine, eventually walking down the track before sprinting away, spending three months hiding from the police, waiting to travel the border. One day in August, he hopped on a train to the border. He was in line to get on the train and he lied to get in, hiding for two days in the bathroom or on the roof or between carriages. He was almost at the border when a guard grabbed him and locked him in a cell on the train. As the train began to slow down, he escaped out a window, rolling into a ditch and then walking for hours, making it to a second train getting to the border town. But he still had to cross the final obstacle out of North Korea, the Yalu River. He hid in the grass until darkness, quietly wading into the water. In the middle of the river, he slipped on a rock and he screamed in pain, a floodlight shining on his back as a guard threatened to shoot him. He kept wading forward. No shots were ever fired, eventually making it across. He walked three days before eventually a man found him collapsed in the middle of the road, eventually realizing he was North Korean. He helped him contact people to get him across the Chinese border, and he eventually was processed in Southeast Asia, and eventually coming to America. This story is truly incredible, a horrific one, yes, but also an inspiring one. With a competent director, this could honestly be a shoe in for multiple Oscar nominations. With incredibly intense scenes, it would be a genuine epic, a hard-hitting drama about one boy's incredible escape. Lee Hyun So Lee Hyun So grew up worshipping her leaders like Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, learning about how evil the outside world was, the US, South Korea and Japan being the enemies. She witnessed a public execution when she was seven, but thought nothing of it. However, in 1995, she received a letter from a co-worker's sister, describing how her family was starving and dying. Soon after, she witnessed a mother and her child dying near a train station without any help, and to survive, they had to live off grass, bugs, and bark. And growing up, there was no lights, only those across the river in China. She lived at the border and often witnessed dead bodies of those who tried to escape, floating down the river. In 1997, she escaped across the river with the help of a border guard in order to go to college, only planning to stay a short while before going back home. However, due to the harsh conditions for North Korean refugees, she had to stay in China as an illegal immigrant. One day, she was caught by police and they interrogated her, testing her Chinese. If any answers were wrong or inconsistent, she would be sent back to North Korea to a prison camp. However, she was able to pass. After 10 years of living as a refugee in China, Lee managed to escape to South Korea and after a rigorous process was granted citizenship, being re-educated and given a house eventually finding her place in South Korea. However, she eventually got word that North Korean police had intercepted money sent to her brother and mother and were going to move her family to the countryside, which in North Korea is nowhere near as nice as it sounds. So she decided to go back and help them meeting her mother and brother in Chiang Mai, before guiding them through a trip through China, in which they were almost caught several times. One time when they were stopped, they told the officer that she was chaperoning deaf and mute people, and somehow he accepted the story, and then went to the Lao border, paying a broker to take her family to the South Korean embassy in Vientiane. On her way to the airport, however, she was informed that her family had been caught at the border, 
She travelled to Laos and paid a bribe and a fine before a month later they were released. However, they were arrested and jailed again. Being extremely close to the North Korean embassy, she couldn't pay off any more bribes and lost hope. However, out of nowhere, an Australian named Dick Stolp helped her and got her the money to help get her family out, saying, I'm not helping you, I'm helping the North Korean people. Showing the hope that the international community can be to the North Korean people, eventually escaping to South Korea and taking her family along. This story would also make for a great drama, the personal struggle of deciding whether or not to go back and the frustrating process of trying to get them through China. However, if I were to pick one of these stories, I think I would choose Charles' story, as it is to me the most intense, horrifying and kind of feeds itself to a great film about one's personal struggle. But the problem is, considering that North Korea considers making a movie like this comparable to a declaration of war, I think all I can do is hope that eventually this regime will be toppled and we can see the incredible stories of struggle and hope from the perspective of the repressed people of North Korea. So that's my idea. What do you guys think? Are there any other stories of North Korean defectors which would make for interesting films? Please let me know, and as always, please remember to like, share, subscribe, and click that notification bell. And until next time... Anyang. Yes, Anyang. Anyang.